Julia, maybe let's start with you. Can you oh, tell? Okay. Yeah, you <laughs> ready? Oh, yeah. So question number one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Scary. <laughs> okay. We'll do it quickly. Yes or no? Ten questions, and then we go. Okay. Now, um, uh, Ukraine, uh, what you do among many things uh, is that when there's like a deoccupied city, you go there and start. Can you explain us the process and why exactly this? Um, yeah, so I can tell a little bit more about Ukraine. It's a pretty big at this point uh, uh, media community, media platform that started with the goal of um, basically opening up Ukraine to the world, but also Ukrainians, because um, we saw that before, like even a lot of Ukrainians had this sort of stereotype and stigma, and it was actually very interesting to connect the, to like the previous pa panel when I was listening to the countries obviously that were occupied by Russia, we were taught to believe that our countries are not as cool and stuff. So um, Ukraine are filmed a lot of territories of Ukraine and uh, has a lot of content, footage, images, interviews with people who are uh, come from currently occupied territories. So it had a lot of connection to the regions that right now you can see under the red map occupied. So when um, Ukraine started liberating territory, uh, there was a huge need to immediately caption uh, people's stories who survived the occupation. So Ukraine immediately started doing this project YouTube series called The Occupation, um, where they go immediately to the freshly liberated territories and look for people, specifically those who um, either survived you know, Russian uh, torture, uh, abuse, and other things, but also those who resisted the occupation strongly. Uh, so any kind of civilians who engaged into uh, into partisan movements, um, civilians who uh, just sort of helped each other during the time, um, soldiers who were liberating the, those areas, and etc. So um, it's it's really hard sometimes to find these connections and to talk to people who just sort of got out and sometimes those, those people still cannot believe that uh, they're back to Ukraine, they're free again, So, and sometimes they're hesitant to talk because they're afraid that Russia might come back again. And if they open up about like what was happening and it's somewhere online. Uh, but what is very interesting about this project as well, because it's on YouTube, everybody can watch it. A lot of Ukrainians, specifically those in Kherson, they were watching the occupation as they were living under Russian occupation, and that was giving them hope. And that was giving them also ideas how to resist Russian occupation, how to not collaborate with Russians, how to maybe trick them if, into if they were collaborating, but actually they're doing the opposite and help, helping the Ukrainian side. So it has a lot of like layers how that project contributed to recording the war crimes as what we're talking, but also um, giving hope to people who live under uh, occupation right now. And how big is the team which actually produces those episodes? Um, I think it's like, I, I, I know definitely there are two producers. There is obviously Bogdan Lohovanenko, who's the founder of Ukrainian, who's interviewing the uh, people themselves. But it's a, it's sort of like a mini trip. There are different people joining all the time. I would say it's like around 10 people, like the core team. Uh, but uh, every expedition, like expedition or like a trip to uh, these territories, they sort of rotate and they go. For example, when her son was liberated, a lot of people with the Ukraine were like fighting who's gonna go to her son first because everybody wanted to go and they were actually thinking of like bringing more teams and more people to do uh, but obviously you need to be conscious of the risks of going to those uh, freshly liberated territories and the safety um, of uh, the crew the, the itself yeah Jana you are actually or your organization you're tracking something different can you tell us a little bit about it yeah uh, so close okay so I'm not an influential speaker, unfortunately. <laughs> That's why I take notes and sometimes I will joke like, uh, so I forgot this word and I need to translate it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, about, uh, yeah, our um, editorial stuff, uh, we, we were preparing for full-scale invasion, but uh, we didn't, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we were. Uh, but, um, so, colleagues from Romania, uh, Sorry, <laughs> send bulletproof vests uh, to everyone who want to be a reporter at the Kiev at that time. But we didn't know uh, where it will start. Uh, so now Slitstvo has uh, mm, the main direction of our work uh, after full-scale invasion. Uh, the first of all, it's um, 
identifying of Russian soldiers who commit war criminals in uh, our territory. Uh, the next, it's uh, reporting from hotspots and uh, documenting war crimes, uh, like uh, the occupation of cities, illegal uh, crossing the border by Ukrainian men, and um, deportation Ukrainians to Russia. And uh, 24 February, after 14 hours uh, the war started, so we published our first investigative story. Uh, we found uh, out who was a pilot of the Russian helicopter, which was down next to Kiev. Uh, so maybe question, <laughs> how we investigate war crimes? Yes. And uh, first of all, we find the crime and uh, victims of the crime, and all, all witnesses, not only victims. Uh, about uh, where do we find information about uh, the crimes? There are for, um, some uh, different sources of it. First of all, it's a site of defense intelligence of Ukraine and the list of the center of uh, defense uh, strategies. Uh, after all, Telegram channels, and if you know <laughs> information from the data, best look for your own. Uh, and uh, moreover, after the full-scale invasion, our auditory grew uh, tenderfold, and uh, so now they bring us stories, and they are eager to help us. Uh, so about after we find uh, crimes and victims or witnesses, we go into field uh, for reporting it. We communicate with these people and uh, try to, uh, to know more and more about uh, Russian soldiers. After that, we figure in our what uh, military units were based in this location. After all, <laughs> we try to identify these Russian soldiers by uh, social networks. We try to search their relatives, and uh, usually they change their names or uh, birthday dates, uh, and it's hard to find them, really. Uh, next, after we identified Russian soldiers, we try to uh, print their photos, and uh, next we into a uh, field uh, in for, for reporting, and uh, we show these photos of Russian soldiers to uh, victims of their crimes. And uh, we try to learn information to prove their committing for war crimes. And uh, after all, we call text Russian militaries for that, and publishing stories. Uh, How big is the team which does that? What? Uh, How big is the team which... Uh, uh, team? Uh, yeah. No, we are about ten, uh, 10 members, maybe now seven or, or eight, something like else. Irina, sorry, I'm going to switch. You are also into... Okay, let me... <laughs> don't, don't be afraid. No. Okay. <laughs> I know it's a bit scary, but uh, uh, you are also into war documentation. Can you tell us about your approach? Yeah, okay, I will start um, with the short story and how it all started because, you know, like, it's a story about several Ukrainian NGO people finding themselves at some point in Warsaw. <laughs> and uh, it's actually the story which is very typical for the NGO landscape. I mean, of course, we did have several human rights defending groups who were documenting war crimes, you know, who were very much into investigating the human rights violations in Crimea, also in the journalistic sphere. But although, so it was mostly focused or concentrated within this human rights defending groups. And when it became massive, you know, all the, like, I mean, journalists, civil society organizations, so we started to think on how we can contribute to the victory or how we can contribute to the accountability mechanisms to make Russia accountable for all the atrocities, all the war crimes that um, it has committed. So basically, Opora is mostly known as a watchdog angel. We did a lot of stuff on the parliament transparency accountability. Uh, we're also known as an election observation mission. So all about, you know, stuff about saving democracy in Ukraine. But on February 24th and afterwards, we were starting to think about how we can use all our legal expertise, because we are also had pretty much experience in drafting the legislation, electoral code, different like laws and political parties and so on and so forth. And so it was like, for us, you know, it was a high time to find our own niche in the old field. 
And uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, so several of Upara people, including me, so we went to Warsaw. And uh, at some point, you know, there, we already had some partners, we already had some good connections with the Polish uh, CSOs, NGOs, Thank and we yeah. And, uh, um, and we decided that a lot of job on war crimes investigating have been done in Ukraine so far, but no one is covering Poland. And since at that time, it was already three million of Ukrainians already crossing the border, already staying in Ukraine and mostly in Warsaw or big cities. So we decided that we're gonna interview them. You know, and for the time being, we have a team of lawyers and also psychologists. So they work as a team because, of course, in the course of interviewing, when you're digging into people's experience, recalling all their, you know, experience back in Kyiv, Bucha, eastern part of Ukraine, you cannot avoid it. You know, you will have to provide some also psychological support for them. Um, so we are interviewing the refugees. We are interviewing those Ukrainians who are permanent, who are temporarily staying in Warsaw, in the shelters, in the biggest one, like the one near Nadazhin. So we are working there day by day, finding witnesses and victims, interviewing them. But we also see our role. So it's not only about gathering the information, but for us, it's also important to make sure that it will be used as a tool, as an instrument. There, that's why we are cooperating with the law enforcement bodies. And it was like our position from the very beginning. So it's not only about collecting the information, but it's also about making use of it. So we have connections, and now we are uh, cooperating with the prosecutor, with local prosecutor in Warsaw, and also with the um, internal, uh, how we call it, against uh, bezpieczeństwa, the safety agency. Against bezpieczeństwa yes. wewnętrznego? Yes. Counterintelligence. Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And actually, you know, the prosecutors in Poland, they told us, oh my God, this is the first experience that we have with NGOs. And we were like, what? You know, because like for us, working with even with the prosecutor general is a usual case because they're pretty open. And Poland was quite a surprise for us so within their kind of close nature. So yeah, so now what we do is basically we are serving as a kind of bridge between all those people, refugees staying in Warsaw. So they provide us uh, with the information and then we process it, we see whether like we are doing some kind of fact checking as well to see whether those people really saw something or they just are so willing to share the story. And then we connect them with the law enforcement uh, bodies because um, as you know, Poland opened the criminal case under national jurisdiction. So they can also, um, they can also um, take um, the uh, Russian uh, soldiers and the leadership to the uh, accountability. So yeah, basically that's it. So you say, uh, besides documenting, you want this to be used. So Oksana, moving on to you, because you actually cover a possible uh, possible establishing of the special tribunal. So tell us a little bit about it. Uh, well, um, my aim is uh, not document documentation, but my aim is uh, the accountability. Accountability of those people who are responsible for the aggression uh, and for all those crimes. So what I'm writing about is about the uh, possibility of creation the uh, special tribunal for the aggression and of, and also I'm writing about the other ways uh, to bring the um, to bring people into account like uh, IC, ICC which is International Criminal Court or uh, the cases under universal jurisdictions and other things um, what is uh, what is very interesting for me is that um, I went to, to The Hague, I visited all the institutions, and now I have a possibility to talk to different lawyers uh, um, who are very well recognized in the world, and I ask them questions, how to create this special tribunal, how to gather the evidence, so that my articles uh, are, are being read not only by people, normal people, but also by lawyers. 
And after this, I get a lot of um, um, people write to me and ask more questions and say that uh, these articles are very good for them and they now understand what to do. Um, as to special tribunal, uh, I think it is, this is very important and why I'm doing this, why I'm writing about it a lot, because uh, if um, we don't, not we, like all the world, uh, bring into account the people who are responsible for this aggression, uh, the more aggressions will be in the future. Because if uh, some dictators see that there is no any accountability, uh, they would do the, do the same. Uh, what is also very important is that the special tribunal, it is uh, not that long as, for example, those international tribunals which were for, Yuga, for former Yugoslavia or for Rwanda, which took uh, for about 20 years or 25 years, uh, the special tribunal for uh, aggression uh, would take much less because this is only one uh, atrocity, which is, uh, well, you don't have to gather lots of evidence because the Russians are in Ukraine and they are trying to, to uh, uh, make this uh, territories which are occupied, they are making it parts of Russia. So there is not much uh, to, uh, to, investigate. To, to investigate, yes. Um, and what is very important that now we have to talk about it in uh, other countries. Uh, because Ukraine needs this support from other countries. We cannot create the international tribunal by ourselves. Um, and what is very important, and now I will address to you as a journalist of different countries, because we, I, what I think and what I'm doing, I'm trying to, uh, I think that we have to explain uh, to people and to, to, uh, to the audience and to uh, maybe politicians, um, that this special tribunal should be created. Uh, I know that uh, now uh, the situation is much better and now we uh, understand that uh, the European countries are, are understanding that this is important but still I think that we should write about it a lot and we have to explain and uh, uh, we have to create this special tribunal. The, most, the more uh, countries do it, the better it will be. What do you need to document a war crime to make it a case? Irena? Me, okay. Um, to make it a, okay, I will put it frankly, like we do not document. And I would really like to emphasize this because neither journalists nor CSOs are not collecting testimonies evidences, nor we are doing the documenting work, I mean, you know, because this is a legal term. And also, at the very beginning, when we were just, uh, you know, diving into the topic, we were also using this, okay, so now we're going to talk to people, uh, take, uh, you know, some testimonies uh, or evidences from them, we will document the case, but this is the work to be done by the law enforcement bodies. We can only assist the process. And basically, what, and also, we have to be very frank with those interviewee, you know, the people we are talking to, what for we gather, we collect this information. So basically, what we do in Warsaw is that we have an application form, a questionnaire, we are asking. Uh, people about their experience during the war, what they have seen, what they have experienced. Um, we asking them about some facts, whether they can justify, you know, some uh, some situations that they really experienced um, during the war times. And then, so we have, we kind of form all the databases, then we translate it into Polish language, and then we all transfer this information to, to the local prosecutor's office. So basically, and then, so we are like very frank with the people saying that, you see, if you want to take Russia to accountability with legal terms, then you will be once more interviewed by a prosecutor because this is the procedure. You know, 
So again, neither CSO nor journalists, you know, like we are not doing this documenting legal documenting no i mean that's great that you're mentioning and this is why in the title of this session we have and or because sometimes there is some people put a lot of some pressure on journalists like document make more photos or talk more because then maybe at some point this can yeah. be used as an evidence or something uh -huh. like this and this is again very tricky you know because yeah. some people that we are interviewing they said oh no i've already spoken to some journalists you know, and I will get reparations or compensations for that. And we say, come on, people, really? Uh, fifth you know? time? Uh, yeah, I have to say yeah. this the fifth time? <laughs> yeah, so it's very tricky. That's why I'm saying, you know, that you have to be, like, really very, um, you know, like, frank with, uh, with the audience. Because they also have their expectations. For some people, it's enough just to share the story. You know, and they want the whole world to know about the atrocities that they came through. For another person, it might be, you know, the compensation, the reparation is the case. For the third person, they want to see those, uh, those criminals in prison. Or I want to see Putin dead. Or I don't know, like people tell different stuff. You know, but you have to be very frank. And even now, uh, also, uh, Oksana was mentioning the ICC. And we were talking also to them, you know, because at the very beginning, everyone wanted to apply to ICC because they were thinking that the mechanism is very similar to the European Court on Human Rights. When you have your, uh, your last name, your first name on the case, and in a long run, in some five years, you're going to have some compensation rep it's like Irina Schweiz versus Russia, you know, but I see it's not the case So yeah. they will come back to you and they will only come back to like three or four percent of all the victims and witnesses and perhaps in like 20 years or 25 years Then you may expect, you know, some some compensation or reparation or be Included into the list of witnesses. So it's again, you know about not letting down people's expectation. Yulia, do yeah. when you enter a liberated city, do, peop, do, do people sometimes refuse to talk to you? Refuse to, sh refuse to share? <clears throat> As I said, it really depends on, I guess, um, what people experienced um, and what kind of their fear is about the possibility of Russia coming back. I know this personally because my family uh, personally survived the occupation in Kyiv region, um, and I think like up until like the six or seven months of uh, the war, and like five months or more after liberation, they still had this fear that well they might come back again. So um, that's probably why a lot of people, especially those who live, you know, like in towns that are almost near Russian border or have, uh, like, for example, I don't know, Kupiansk, they're very, very close to the current uh, front, front bordering, or, or Kherson, I mean, currently the front line is just like across the, the river, basically, because Russians are there. Um, they still might be very afraid, especially to talk about the techniques with which they st sort of try to um, overcome the occupation or fight Russia from the within or have they refused to give critical information because they know that they might, might like see it and find out and then uh, just you know they will be uh, prosecuted after if Russia come back so that's like I think like is the main barrier obviously um, like you need to establish trust but uh, a lot of people are actually seeking uh, spaces or people that they can talk to and dump this information or just simply so Ukraine actually meets a lot of people in the streets uh, in the li recently liberated towns and just d does like quick walk pops when asking and people just start talking to you and sharing from sometimes they would start talking about very simple like not having like bread or food and then they would go into something more like dark uh, telling about like well my neighbor's brother was tortured and killed uh, so um, People just want to talk to because imagine what they lived through. They probably didn't have much of a connection uh, to the world. Uh, they didn't have a lot of obviously trust to the occupational authorities. So they sort of were remembering the times of the USSR where the, the rule was like you don't 
talk to anyone about anything. You're better off if you want to survive just staying in your house and being quiet. So um, when they see Ukrainians, obviously, they, they and journalists who want to hear their stories, they immediately open up and just want to share their experience. So it's it really depends. Some people might be more conscious and scared to share, and some people refuse to give interviews uh, because they, they know that they uh, might be even, you know, found by Russians, especially those who, as I said, like who live, live near the border or the front line. Like, it's never certain for how long they're gone. We obviously hope that they're gone forever, but you never know. Yana, yeah, what kind of challenges do you have when you're trying to track down Russian, Russian soldiers in Ukraine? Um, with people, uh, we, in general, so, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, kind of good question. I don't know. Uh, when we visit the occupied territories, which were occupied some months ago, we no, people uh, do not uh, want to talk to us. And I understand them because they don't want uh, to leave that experience again, bad experience. And that's only one, because um, we identify uh, Russian soldiers. And we cannot do this now when her son just only deoccupied, because uh, we need to find them, to check out, uh, ch fact check them, and uh, moreover, and uh, it needs some time. Uh, that's why people do not want to talk to us sometimes, <laughs> as it's only a problem. Uh, we've seen that the purpose of our investigative uh, and in investigations are um, is a punishment of perpetrators and uh, identifying of this uh, of this once Russian militaries who committed this war crime is there. Uh, for future tribunals, it's uh, important um, to know in which locations they were. And that's why it's important to us as for investigate <laughs> journalists uh, to, to know how to um, to identify loca location. So we have a case, uh, uh, one girl, 18-year-old, uh, Lisa, it's her pseudonym, uh, uh, she uh, tells us uh, that uh, <laughs> she communicates with Russian militaries in Telegram bot, it's something like Tinder or Mamba. It's uh, uh, no <laughs> no, uh, not a dating app, but a Telegram chat where they can communicate with each other. And uh, this girl, she's genius, really, <laughs> because uh, she communicates and they um, send uh, for her uh, photos and videos. And uh, this girl uh, sent us these photos and videos, and uh, thus we can uh, to identify this location in where they were. Uh, that's all. <laughs> it's very interesting uh, story. <laughs> uh, next, we, with our partners, anti-corruption headquarters, create uh, an urgent data bus uh, where there are under 150,000 Russian militaries. So is the aim of this project is to identify Russian soldiers and servicemen of the Russian Federation uh, uh, who are directly involved in this invasion now. So it's fact-checked information. And uh, is it so? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, for, for nine months after the start of Great War, uh, we identified and published stories about more than 200 uh, Russian militaries. I think it's, uh, we, we do important work, like as a um, editor office, like our, our. It, speaking truly, it's, um, I want to believe that it will be helpful in the next time. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not we, but uh, maybe our child, so uh, next and next uh, generations uh, will have reparations and uh, Slowly, good life without Russia. <laughs> Oksana, my final question. Uh, how would you like media, not from Ukraine, to support uh, you and people who do this work here? Well, I, I just wanted to mention one uh, very important thing. 
uh, for journalists, and uh, it was uh, really very interesting for me to understand it. Uh, when I was interviewing uh, Anna Neistat, she's um, uh, from Cluny Foundation, and she's uh, the director of uh, uh, the program docket. They are, they are documenting the war crimes, and then uh, they are uh, uh, giving them uh, to prosecutors. And when I was talking to her, and she told me that journalists sometimes may harm the investigation. And why? Because uh, sometimes our questions are too vast and uh, too precise. And when those people who answered our questions, those victims or witnesses who answered our questions, then are being in the court and giving the answers in 10 or 15 years, they can't remember the color of the dress which they mentioned in the article. And this gives the opportunity to the defenders to uh, discredit this witness and or, or victim or these witnesses uh, and to say that we cannot believe them. So when we as a journalist do such inter interviews, we probably should think about this also. Mm -hmm. As to the help, um, uh, I've, I've already said that because I, I think that uh, the journalists from other countries uh, could also the, it, it would be better if we communicate together and if they uh, try to find out how the, uh, the special tribunal can be created. They could write about it to, to, the, audience, to the audience. They have to, um, uh, that people have to understand that uh, we can create this special tribunal only together. Because if the special tribunal is created by, by eight countries, now we have support of eight countries. Uh, if we have this support of, if, if this uh, tribunal is created by eight countries, Russia will say, come on, these are European countries, and this is what we are saying, Europe is against us. But if it is the whole world, or at least, at least the more countries, and not only European, but also from other continents, uh, this will, uh, be, this will show that this is uh, the fair tribunal and uh, this will stop what I said already, this will stop the other dictators of, of the same thing. And also, if I may, to add to, to the yeah. last point. Yeah, yes. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I also would like, because we are also advocating for the establishing of the special tribunal on the uh, crime of aggression, and I think it's important for the international community to understand that this is not a wish of the Ukrainian government. Yeah. You know, this is not a desire of Ukrainian, I know, CSOs, whatever. This is a huge demand of the whole Ukrainian society because we need justice and we do not want to wait for 20 or 30 years, you know. We want to have justice as soon as possible. Therefore, we have to mobilize all the efforts media, civil society, I don't know, government, president, all international partners, and be a single voice. We just need justice. And uh, I would also like support Oksana's that it will also help to put this democratic practice back in Ukraine, in the whole world, to have the stability and also not to let other dictators, you know, do the, the same shit again. Yes, because we have lots of conventions, the international law, which worked till Russia started this invasion. I also and now this, this doesn't work. I also wanted to add that the reason, <clears throat> I, I see a huge historical link, the reason why this uh, full-scale invasion happened, because Russia never was brought to justice, starting from the USSR. Russia calls itself like a successor of USSR when it's convenient for Russia, like as we see in UN, but why Russia is not responding for the crimes against humanity that were done, the USSR and the government. Russia has never responded for uh, the Holodomor and other crimes, and this is particularly the reason why we as Ukrainians and other nations occupied and oppressed by Russia have never had restorative justice like other nations who survived, who saw their um, war criminals put on trial and if we let this 
go down again, then it's, as Oksana said again, like any other dictator will see like, well, if Russia gets away with it, like it means that I can do it the same way. I'm gonna just play by their playbook. So it's, it's so important and it, it's really, it's a huge societal effort as Irina said. And that's a perfect ending of this panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>